Hi there, I'm Rena Ninen, host of Hero, the hidden economics of remarkable women. Hero is a limited series podcast from Foreign Policy, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On season two of Hero, I talk with women around the world in places like South Africa, Nigeria, and Pakistan, who are changing the status quo in surprising ways. The second season of the hidden economics of remarkable women is out now. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Demore, author of two New York Times best-selling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co-host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at drlisademore.com. Episode 71, My Kid Was Dumped by Her Friends. How Can I Help? Are we done yet with this pandemic? I know, Rena. Everybody is so over it. What are you hearing? What I'm hearing is almost impossible to distinguish from clinical depression. Wow. You know, when I'm talking with people, adults and kids and teenagers, the mood they're describing the low feelings they have, as I sit there listening as a clinician, I'm like, okay, is this two plus years in a pandemic plus the long, dark winter, or is this clinical depression? I mean, they really sound similar right now. Why do you think so many people feel like they're at a low point and are desperate for help? I think winter plus the seeming endlessness of this is just people are just worn down and then everyone around them is worn down. So nobody's in a good mood. Mm -hmm. Like you're just going from grumpy person to grumpy person, which makes it hard to feel good and upbeat. Mm. You know, I had to go in um, pre-pandemic. I would go into New York, take the train five times a week for work. And I haven't done that in two years. And I went in and I found myself exhausted in these meetings of meeting people. Like, yeah. understanding sort of how to reconnect with people is a new thing. And we got this letter. Um, I know a lot of people are struggling with their kids and friends and reestablishing that friendship. And it says, hi, Dr. Lisa, I'm hoping you can help me with my 15-year-old daughter. She's been dumped by her friend group and needs to start over socially. She reached out to the girls in the group to ask what she had done wrong, and no one would reply. Needless to say, my daughter was devastated. We talked about reaching out to other friends, which she has done. They're nicer to her online, but don't include her in their plans. She's now talking to a therapist, but it's only helping so much. Sundays are the worst. She dreads going back to school and having to be around former friends who pretend like she doesn't exist. It's heartbreaking to watch, and I have no idea how to help her navigate the reset. Also, what and how do I say something to the moms of the former girls? I want to call out their mean girl behavior, even though I know nothing will change. Thanks so much. I love your podcast. Friends and I listen and discuss it every week. Where do you even begin with this? Well, let me tell you, Rena, this I am hearing a lot. A lot of this, of kids sort of suddenly being iced out of groups that they've been part of or, you know, kind of friction that would normally be manageable, kids just dropping other kids, kids, co you know, kind of coming into coalitions against individual kids. This is something that has – I was hearing more of early in the pandemic than usual, and then it's just gone up from there. So it's um, horrible, horrible, and not that rare right now. Wow. But why do you think it's happening? I mean, I mean, you're kind of explaining to me some of this is sort of natural and before, but like this is so nasty. It's really nasty. And, you know, we can't really know group to group, dynamic to dynamic what's going on. But here is something that always pops up in my mind when I hear stories like this, which is that sometimes when kids are struggling to find what I would call like social glue, you know, ways to feel connected to their peers – one of the ways they do it is to gang up on someone. Wait, wait, wait. You're, so you're saying they don't find their social footing. So th the default is to just like bully people and be mean? Well, it may be more like there's a, a group of kids, you know, boys or girls who are kind of loosely connected and want to have more to connect around, want to be more tight knit with one another. Yeah, yeah. And in the pandemic, it's really hard for kids to have 
happy things to connect around. You know, so much of like good social stuff is like, and then we went to this like funny movie together, yeah. and then we yeah. had this like, you know, goofy sleepover together. And so, you know, kids need ways to have social glue. And what we want is good social glue when they're connecting around shared interests and enjoying one another's company. That has been, you know, seriously depleted by the nature of the pandemic. And so I think some of what we're seeing is kids connecting around unhealthy social glue, which is, well, we don't have that much in common. We don't have that much we can do together, but we can mutually gang up on mm. this one person who we all have decided, you know, true or not, like is somehow annoying to us. And so our tight-knit strength, our sense of being a group together is going to be drawn from us mutually disliking the same person. God, so it's so messed up. It's so messed up. It is so messed up. And it's one of those things where, you know, obviously for the kid who's getting iced out, it is, it's awful. It is awful. I mean, it, it really, I very rarely use the term, but it definitely can move towards feeling traumatizing, like just completely overwhelming to deal with. And I hate that kids are doing this. Of course, as a clinician, I'm like, I see why. Like, mm -hmm. I don't approve of it, but I get it. Like, when you don't have much to come together around, it can end up being pretty negative. And it's funny. I was just talking with a colleague at a school the other day, and she gave me a different version of the story of the kids, like, just totally coalescing around how stressed they are, which, you know, mm -hmm. also happened before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But again, you get the sense of they don't have much to come together around. And so these negative things can become handy and really destructive, mm -hmm. but also serve a purpose of giving kids a sense of we're in this together. Mm -hmm. So what can this mom do to help? It's so heartbreaking. So she's gotten her kid a therapist, which we know is a triumph and the right thing and not easy to do. Yeah. So Okay, you know how, Rena, sometimes I can get into, like, really long and tedious metaphors? Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> okay. I think I metaphors are great. great. It makes things click for me, but okay. This one's a little, like, it's a B plus at <laughs> best, but it's still useful, and it's really, really useful in these situations. So one way I have helped kids out of situations like this is to help them take it less personally, help it feel less personal, right? Because of course it feels intensely personal. So the first thing a parent can do is to give the explanation I just gave. You know what, honey, maybe they are really struggling to find ways to feel connected to each other and you have become the victim of their attempt to feel tight mm -hmm. is to, you know, box you out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms of this metaphor, <laughs> the way I think it through and the way I think a parent could explain this to, you know, a kid who's 15, so she's probably taking chemistry, is that I think of friendship groups, certainly middle school, early high school, but honestly, Rena, right now, early high school looks like middle school socially. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. it is really you're, not you're good. You're saying they're delayed because of oh, not being in class and masks and all that. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I mean, we are seeing the kind of base bullying nastiness that we usually can check at the door by 7th or 8th grade is creeping well into ninth or 10th, which is wow. its own misery. And this child would be in the 10th grade probably. So what you can say is, you know, think about social groups as almost like chemical compounds. And every kid in the social group is an atom, and they have their, you know, chemical compound. They, they come together. Some compounds are more stable than others. So, you know, the, the, those friendship groups where, like, everyone gets along and it's kind of happy and, you know, they sort of click along. And then there are friendship groups, and I think this is what, you know, we can think about with this child – where the friendship group wasn't all that stable. And the let's say there were four other atoms in this group, <laughs> right, besides this child. And they decided, oh, I know how to stabilize. Let's kick out that atom, and that will strengthen our bonds. We'll be this group of, you know, kids who, who come together around this, you know, strengthening bond of having kicked that atom out. So it can start to help us if we think about this girl who's been iced out as like she's now a free-floating atom. And it's in the name of that former friendship group trying to strengthen their bonds. And and she did the right thing. She reached out to say, did I do something? What's wrong? And the fact that she got no response does make me think even more that they're like, 
Nope, nope, nope. The whole goal is to strengthen our bonds and to keep that atom out as a way of having, you know, an attempt at stabilizing our chemical compound with stronger bonds. So that's a start on how to think about it. You know, I dropped out of chemistry and physics in, in college because I thought journalists don't need it. Um, <laughs> I was wrong. You really don't. Stay in. Well, I'm probably, no, I don't even know how right I'm getting this, but it works well enough for 10th graders. I, I see what you're saying is like there are just some chemicals that, that when combined can be absolutely combustible. But as yes. parents, they don't have it written on their forehead like this chemical is going to combust. Step away protect your child, right? Or the chemical you have today, in two and a half years, you need to chuck it because it is going to absolutely be volatile. You really don't know. And then in the pandemic, you have no data to work with, right? We just have no idea what's going on with kids and yeah. what, you know, what their moods are. And so it's, it's a very tricky time. But then, okay, once we have this metaphor that I am now going to beat to death. Are you ready for this right now? Okay. I'm going to beat it okay. to death. This is the most chemistry and physics I've ever done in, in my life. Okay, and on. me too. Like, <laughs> me too. And I'm, I'm kind of making up chemistry. But I think, Actually, but like, let's just go with it. Lisa, we're going to pause for a second, take a quick break, and then we're going to come back for this chemistry lesson that even I will be able to understand. Rena and I have some fun news for users of Facebook. You can now subscribe and listen to the Ask Lisa podcast right on the Ask Lisa page of Facebook. Go there, click on podcast either on the mobile app or your desktop, and it will download for you every week. And you can join in a conversation with us and other listeners about each week's episode. Welcome back to the Ask Lisa podcast. We are talking about combustible friendships, chemistry, Lisa Take it away. Okay. So we're back to this idea that this friendship group may have kicked her out to strengthen their bonds, to stabilize their chemical compound by kicking this poor atom out. So now we have a free-floating atom. Now, with this metaphor, we can also explain something else that the parent observed in this letter, which is this girl is reaching out to other kids who are nice to her online, but don't include her at school. What's that about? That is about them having stable compounds they don't want to compromise. Oh. And so if you think about it, Rena, like let's say you had three or four girlfriends that you just love from college and you went on a girlfriend's getaway once a year. Mm -hmm. And that's your thing and you love each other and you've got this stable chemical compound of the four of you do great together. There might be someone you all know from college and like from college who you would never invite on your girlfriend's weekend. Because it would mess up the working chemistry mm. that the four of you have been able to establish. Mm. I can understand that. I can understand that. It totally makes sense. And that explanation, I will tell you, for me, has helped a lot of kids when they're like, I don't get it. This person's nice to me individually. That person's nice to me individually. This kid will even do stuff with me on the weekends. But when we get to school, I'm not invited into their friendship group. Uh. And having my belabored, over-elaborate metaphor that it's not that they actually don't like that kid. It's that they have a stable compound and adding an atom to it could destabilize it. And so they're not going to do it. So they'll be nice to that atom individually, but they won't bring that person in. So where does this leave the girl? Like, what should she do? I mean, I get it. These are Adams don't want to mix together, but, but you know, she, she just wants what her life was like before with her friends, and she can't seem to find any friends. This is so wrong. It's so bad. Okay, so here's the non-pandemic advice, and then we have to think about how to make this work in a pandemic, because it's hard in no pandemic. This is even harder in an actual pandemic. So one piece of advice is look for compounds that are looking to add an atom. You know, not all compounds have sort of consolidated and become very stable, right? So if we think about, you know, the college friends or maybe some nice girls who are great to her on the weekends but don't let her in at school, they're not looking for a new member of their chemical compound. So it is often the case in schools or in communities that there are, you know, groups of kids who are not so um, stabilized in that compound, and they're open to adding kids, you know, that they, they're they flexible or they're easygoing about it, or they're not worried that adding a kid will destabilize their relationships. Yeah. And, and one of the ways you see this play out under normal conditions 
is that sometimes, and this is typically, again, been more seventh, eighth grade, but like we can now do the pandemic multiplier and push this deeper into development. Mm -hmm. You'll see a seventh grader who notices that there's this pack of probably popular kids that they want to be part of. And let's often assume this is a sort of stable compound of popular kids who are not necessarily looking to add atoms. And they will set their sights on joining that compound and keep running into resistance. And they'll have all these other nice kids in the class who are like, you can sit with us, come hang out with us, like be yeah. part of us. And they're rebuffing it, rebuffing it, missing it, missing it. And so for them, it's also helpful to say, kid, look at this. You're trying to join a compound that's not looking to add atoms. There's this really nice compound that is inviting atoms. Like, yeah. give but it up you about the popular kids. Uh, but how can you tell? You know, the mom said she's gone to other friends and tried, but they, they just – how how does a teen figure out who's looking to add atoms, right? Okay. So it's a little easier under – non-pandemic conditions because right. then you know there are those like you can tell like there's a spot at their table they you know they mm. it won't disrupt what they've got going for you to slide in and join right like kids can sense that so then the question is how do you sense that in a pandemic and you know it's tricky lunch is super weird now yeah, for kids yeah. and then the masks make it very hard to read cues um so i think we want to throw that idea on the table to say, look, there are probably compounds that are atom friendly right now, looking to add people. Your job is to look for them. And sometimes, Rena, I will tell you, once you get this elaborate metaphor going with the kid, it helps them move their energies in a better direction. Because often they're like, why did that compound drop me? I need to, I want to try to be back with that compound. So they're thinking about the compound that dropped them. And then they're thinking, why won't these kids who are nice to me on the weekends let me in at school? And mm -hmm. so then they're thinking about that. And so one of the things that can help is to say, you know, let those go. Like, the, you know, that that is beyond your power or those kids have their own dynamics going on that are going to continue to make this challenging for you. Turn your energies to who's out there, who would welcome you. And so that can help. Okay. Now, I want to go back for one second quickly to the friends who are nice online, but not in person. That really bothers me because I feel like isn't that a red flag? And couldn't this be a good teachable moment for, you know, adulthood down the road of people who are kind of nice, but then in larger groups, maybe not? How how would you approach that and, and deal with that piece? It's funny you mention that because, like, don't you feel like that has happened to you? And I, I remember yeah. times in my training where there are people who, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, are pleasant to you, but yes. then in a group, they're not. And I'll tell you what I remember it most distinctly, Rena. Um, it was when I was really early in my training. Actually, I, was, I wasn't even in training yet. I was just out of college. And I was working, actually, at the Yale Child Study Center. And I was a full-on research grunt. I mean, I was as like, low on the totem pole as you could possibly be. And there was a very esteemed psychologist who I happened to know through a connection who had met with me and had lunch with me and was nice to me when it was just the two of us. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was walking down the hall one day, and I happened to be with somebody who even ranked above him. Mm. And we ran into him, and he pretended not to know me. Oh, my gosh. And I think it was that he felt like it would not look good if he knew who a research grunt was. This is, oh you know, this gosh. is not a person Hierarchies. I hold. Yeah. yeah. And it was really funny because the person I was with, who was a total class act, um, she said, hey, do you know Lisa? And then he was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my Lord. I was like, I just lost all respect for this person. Right. So right, it totally happens. So I do think, Rena, you are on to something where at home between the letter writer and this child, you could say, you know, you learn things about people watching how they treat you in private and how they treat you in public. Or, you know, Rena, it's like going on a date with somebody who mistreats a waiter. You're like, okay, this is oh, over. Yeah. Rule number one, if I see that, I'm out. You're done. Right? So I think there's something there. Okay, I have one other way this child could try to go at this or this parent could try to support her. And again, back to this now absolutely beaten to death metaphor. The other thing is to look for other free-floating atoms. You know, it sometimes happens that there are other kids who have had a hard time yeah. finding their group or not latched in. And, you know, often if you say to a 10th grader or even a 7th grader, well, who else isn't really, you know, plugged in right now? Or who else seems to be 
kind of alone at lunch. They'll be like, oh, I don't want to hang out with that kid. You know, like that that kid's not my first choice. And I think this is a good moment to say, you know, you might want to be a little bit more flexible about that. Or you might want to be open to the idea that you have more that you could enjoy with that child than you thought. Or, you know, just keep an open mind. Like you're a free floating atom. They're a free floating atom. Yeah. Being alone is really awful. I wouldn't rule out making some bonds with some other free-floating atoms, at least for now. Yeah. I want to ask you also about the the piece of this letter about whether she should go to the other moms. I know you're a big advocate of sort of trying to help kids work it out, but is this a case where she should approach the other moms and talk about this? This is such a tough one, Rena. So... I think I would say it depends. And I think a lot of what it depends on is the kind of relationship the mother has with the other moms. What if it's just, you know, in this pandemic, we're so isolated? What what if it's like, you know, tangential, they're not super close to begin with, but I'd probably they know the girls it. are. Really? Yeah, you don't think I it's just... worth them maybe having like a teachable moment? And Well, it's it's hard because here's the thing. If somebody called you and said, your kid's mistreating my kid, you know, most parents' instinct is to stick up for their own kid. Totally. Yeah. And it's pretty rare for a parent to say, I've been wondering if my child was mistreating your child. And then, you know, so I think it's, in some ways, it's not likely to go well. It's likely to make things worse. I will also tell you, very few 10th graders would ever make, want you to make that phone call. Mm, and, and I think, you know, that's sense. another thing, you know, that these are, even though there is this maturational delay, they're still 15 year olds, they're still sophomores in high school, probably. And I mean, can you imagine when you were a sophomore in high school, if your mom picked up the phone and called another no, sophomore's no. mom, I, you'd I, like cringe, cringe, mortified, no, where it gets hard, Rita, and, and this is something I don't remember growing up with is when the parents are friends. And when I was growing up, like my folks had no contact with my friend's parents. Like, I mean, they kind of knew who they were and they would like recognize them in the grocery store, but they did not socialize with them. They did not look to socialize with them. And interestingly, in my own daughter's lives, there are parents of their friends who I really like. Mm -hmm. And I have made a point of waiting until my girls are out of the house to become friends with them. Wow, really? Yeah. You mean like off to college? Yeah, like with my older daughter. I mean, there's a, a couple of her friends whose parents I think are absolutely terrific. And I can imagine reaching out to socialize with them. But I've been very deliberate in my mind about waiting. Really? Because, yeah, because I see this drama stuff go down. Wow. And I often see it feeling that much worse when there's the layer of the parents' friendships over the layer. And, you know, this is like my community is big enough and Mm -hmm. we have enough degrees of freedom that I can easily do this. This isn't so easy in communities where kids stay in the school for a very long time. And so people who are your play play group when your kids were five are still the friends. So I'm not saying every family can or should do what I did. But I think this gets a lot harder when there's friendship drama among a friendship group and the parents are Mm. also like go on vacations together or spend time together. So for me, I think a lot of it would depend if there's not that layer of being connected socially, I would probably just leave it alone. Have you witnessed during your time practicing like, you know, two sets of parents who are super close, their kids are super close. And when there's an issue, how, how have they dealt with it that's been successful? I think it's really hard. I think it's really hard. And I think it does take incredible grace on both sides. Yeah. Because sometimes, I mean, it can be really ugly between the kids. And the parents are like, so what are we going to do about the fact that we were all going to go vacationing together, you right. know, in. And so I think the parents have to be able to call and say, look, this is awkward. And I don't know who's to blame. And I'm actually not even interested in pointing f- fingers. But how are we going to do this in a dignified way that honors the fact that our kids aren't getting along right now. I mean, I think that that's got to be happening. That is so good. Just confront it, say it for what it is, and don't judge. Just say, I'm not interested in pointing fingers or judging. I love that. That's great. Yeah. So, but I, this letter broke my heart. And also, I'm so glad that we had a chance to think it through because I think it really gets at a huge number of dynamics that a lot of people are struggling with. 
Wow. You broke my heart twice. First, this letter was just so painful when we got this in our inbox, but also to hear you say that you are hearing this, like this has exploded everywhere. So I just hope maybe today in this podcast, parents who are struggling with it know they're not alone because so often the issues we tackle are issues I had no idea so many people are struggling with. Yeah. And I think, especially with teenagers, when your kid is struggling, you can't call everybody about it. You know, if your four-year-old yes. is, you know, having terrible sleep, you can like put up on Facebook, my four-year-old isn't yeah. sleeping, help. Yes. But once it's an adolescent, it becomes very private. And so this is why I'm so grateful for our community and our podcast is that we can talk about these things and hopefully people don't have to feel so alone. This is great. So what do you have for us, Lisa, for Parenting to Go? For Parenting to Go on this one, I think the gift that parents can give adolescents is the gift of perspective. So when you are a 15-year-old and you have been dumped by your friends, it really feels like the end of the world. Like it really feels like there's no point to anything anymore. And, And that is a very powerful sense of just this is awful. How do I move forward? As a middle aged parent, you know this stinks. It's awful. But it will be a really yucky chapter in a very long book. And so I think that the parenting to go on this is that we want to walk a very delicate line as adults in both validating how deeply upsetting this is for our kids or anything like this, and then saying, I want you to know I am 100% confident that you will look back on this and it will be something that happened. It will not be the story that defines your life. The gift of perspective. I love that. That is so great. And we are so excited for our episode next week. We've got a special guest, a dad of three, former attorney general for the New York Southern District, Preet Bharara. He's got a new children's book out called Justice Is, a guide for young truth seekers. We're going to talk about justice, democracy, and how do you teach your kids about fairness? We hope you join us. I'll see you next week, Lisa. I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to asklisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.